Welcome to Arkansas Wildlife. Springtime brings the peak of fishing season here in the natural state. Warming water temperatures send the fish to the banks to spawn, and warming air temperatures make for great days on the water for Arkansas anglers. While we're out there enjoying the fishing though, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is working behind the scenes to protect our fisheries. And one of the biggest threats to fisheries here in Arkansas are aquatic nuisance species. One of the latest nuisance species to show up is the northern snakehead. And this week, we're gonna look at the history of the northern snakehead in Arkansas and across the country, and also see what the Game and Fish Commission is doing to protect our native fisheries against this latest threat. But first, another key job of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is to enhance fisheries through one of the nation's largest state-owned hatchery systems. This week, we're headed over to the Joe Hogan Fish Hatchery at Lone Oak to look into its history and see how it's enhancing fishing in the natural state. All that in this week's winner of an Arkansas hunting and fishing license right after this break. Arkansas Wildlife is brought to you in part by Academy Sports and Outdoors. For all, for less. Arkansas has one of the largest state-owned fish hatchery systems in the nation, and the Game and Fish Commission's Joe Hogan Hatchery at Lone Oak has been growing fish almost as long as the commission has existed. It's really interesting when you, when you go back and look at the history of the agency and see where this hatchery came into being. It was very early in the history of the agency. The agency was starting, what, 1915, and in 1927, those early commissioners were already looking for a central location to create what they termed the world's largest fish hatchery. They purchased the land in 1928. Um, 276 acres is what they purchased. Um, when the uh, construction was completed sometime in the 1950s, I believe there was 214 acres of ponds and uh, 57 ponds total. So it took them a long time to get that construction completed. They really didn't have any equipment when they started. They had uh, a lot of guys with shovels and and wagons and mules and dirt slips and, and they just picked at it for many, many years. But when it was completed in the 1950s, it basically looked the, the same from the 1950s until now, so almost 50, 60 years. Uh, the configuration of the hatchery really hasn't changed up until recently. Early Game and Fish employees carved the hatchery out of an existing rice farm and immediately started raising sport fish. So in 1929, they had largemouth bass and crappie that they had collected from the White River brought those in and put those in those first 16 ponds and were able to harvest uh, those ponds in 1929. So there's been fish harvested from Joe Hogan and stock since uh, 1929. Although methods and techniques have changed over the decades, the Joe Hogan hatchery has consistently produced fish for the enjoyment of Arkansans. These days, the hatchery turns out several million fish each year. We're around 1.7, 1.8 million fish uh, that was cultured uh, and stocked. Uh, however, we do a lot, of, a lot of fish for other facilities that doesn't really fall into that same category. So we may culture five, six, seven million fish, and a lot of those may go to other facilities for, uh, for further grow out. So annually, we produce around six million fish and may stock anywhere from one and a half to two million of those into public water. Aquaculture techniques have improved since the early days of the Joe Hogan hatchery, but one thing that hasn't changed is the labor-intensive nature of the fish business. It is a lot, and, and I will say this, when I first started, it was, it was overwhelming a lot more so than it is now, uh, but I'm surrounded by a pretty good group of guys and everybody knows their role and everybody knows their job and, and, and they're eager to come to work and they enjoy what we're doing here and, and they can see a tangible product going out that's providing opportunities for people uh, to, to harvest. And I think, that is, uh, I think that's part of the reason that, that we've got guys that come to work eager to do this every day. So it's, uh, 
it's easier it's easier for me when you got a crew of guys that's that's uh, eager to come to work every day and, and get after it. So I'm um, I'm fortunate to have the crew that I've got. The Joe Hogan State Fish Hatchery is the prime source for stockable catfish in the natural state, and right now. Our family and community fishing program is stocking more than three dozen bodies of water, one of which is likely very close to you. To learn more about the family and community fishing program and other news about fishing in Arkansas, visit fisharkansas.com. Whether casting a line in search of trophy trout, hiking a trail to take in some beautiful scenery, or paddling a canoe down a pristine freshwater stream. Nothing beats a day spent in the outdoors. But for those in charge of managing fish, wildlife, and ecosystems, there's a constant worry, the threat of invasive species. One of the biggest uh, challenges facing uh, fisheries managers right now across the country are invasive or what we call aquatic nuisance species and a lot of times these are species that are not native to a certain area they don't have predators uh, that, that keep them in check and they get somewhere new and they're able to flourish and spread out and they affect the native wildlife one important thing to remember is that preventing aquatic nuisance species from ever getting established in an area is a much easier fix than trying to combat them once they are established invasive species can take many forms if you've ever driven through the Mississippi Delta, you've likely seen kudzu, otherwise known as the vine that ate the south. It was brought to the U.S. in the 1920s to fight soil erosion and has now overtaken many native plants. Under the right conditions, the weed can grow a foot a day. And who hasn't heard of, or had a rude introduction to, flying carp? Asian carp were initially stocked in southern waterways to eat algae and clean up small ponds, but flooding allowed them to get into the Mississippi River and its tributaries. The fish have expanded their range, and with few natural enemies, their numbers have exploded. When you take a ride up one of these rivers, the vibration of the boat motor reveals the sheer number of these fish. They pose serious risks to native species and also can cause injuries to boaters. In recent years, another aquatic nuisance species has been discovered in the United States carrying with it the promise of impending doom for lakes and rivers in its path, the snakehead from Asia. The northern snakehead is a fish that very closely resembles the native bowfin, also known as the grinnel. It's kind of a tube-like cylindrical fish. Uh, it has teeth. Um, and biology-wise, they, they are very successful at reproducing. They take a lot of care of their young, which means a high survival uh, of their young and uh, they, they have a lot of characteristics for invasiveness because they're able to withstand uh, being out of water as long as they're moist for extended periods of time. So during a rainstorm, they really can, can slither across land and move from body of water to body of water, which makes them very uh, good survivalists. The discovery of a snakehead in a pond in Maryland in 2002 set off mass hysteria about the potential damage the fish could cause to the region's fisheries, which included the Potomac River system. Subsequent newspaper articles and television news stories dubbed the snakehead Fishzilla, or Frankenfish. There were even horror movies made about the snakehead. If a breeding pair gets out of this lake and into the river system, there'll be no stopping them. And they are coming. Fish and wildlife agencies in the eastern U.S. were sent into a frenzy on how to stop the snakehead spread. But less than two years later, the northern snakehead had become established in the Potomac. In Arkansas, the dreaded call came in 2008 when a farmer near Brinkley contacted the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission after finding a snakehead in an area flooded by heavy rain. Our understanding is that around 2000, a, a farmer was approached to grow snakeheads uh, for a live sale market out of the East Coast. And around 2002 is when they were discovered in Maryland. Quickly, the federal government made that fish illegal. And our understanding is that they'd already been eliminated from the state of Arkansas, or so the farmer thought. But in reality, some must have survived. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, along with wildlife officials from Mississippi and Tennessee, jumped into action and launched Operation Mongoose, which set out to kill snakeheads using an established fish toxin applied from the land, water, and even the air. In 2009, 
Uh, operation Mongoose uh, went down, which was, to my knowledge, the largest operation by the fisheries division uh, ever conducted. And the problem is this part of the world, the Arkansas Delta, is very flat. It's lots of series of ditches, and when water gets up, there's water everywhere. And there's lots of places where there's stagnant water, one foot, two foot of water. And again, with the st uh, survival characteristics that the snakehead has, it's able to get into all of these. So it wasn't as simple as running around in a boat and throwing powdered rotenone, which is what we would do in a lake or, or a stream situation. We brought in uh, rental equipment, things called marsh masters that are amphibious vehicles that are able to go around uh, in really tough conditions. We were delivering by helicopter and other means. It was a no holds barred uh, effort to get these gone. As it turns out, Operation Mongoose wasn't successful in totally eradicating the snakehead and it has now spread to several eastern Arkansas waterways. In the end, also because of the flooding characteristics and what was going on in the Delta and the fact that they'd been out for some time, the fish had already gotten and established in some of these drainages and despite Game and Fish's heroic efforts, we were unsuccessful at eliminating the fish. A decade removed from the attempt to stop the spread of snakeheads, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is once again turning its attention to this aquatic nuisance species. The goal now is to study the fish to determine the best way to manage its spread and find out how the invasive fish may affect native species. So now that we've had this fish for some time, we are conducting a number of studies to track movements of snakeheads and find out when they go to different size water bodies, do they get out of the flow, in the flow, upstream, downstream, find out how they move. And many of our neighbors in the Mississippi River drainage are curious to know what those things look like. Another thing that we're looking at is their diet, what they eat, how they overlap, and we're trying to assess bowfin, largemouth, crappie, things like that. How do they affect these fish? Do they eat the same things, don't they? What's the competition like, and what, what does that look like for the future? Several years ago, the fisheries chief was approached by surrounding states wanting to know what's going on with snakeheads, what's their impact to native species, how are they moving, their concern is when are they going to get to my state. And so what we wanted to do is actually set out to start trying to answer some of these questions in regards to snakeheads. How fast are they moving within a year? What kind of impacts are they having on our native species, especially things like our sport fish, largemouth bass? And then just in general, how fast are they growing? Those were some of the questions that we were wanting to try to get at to help educate our surrounding states about when they're gonna get them and what kind of impacts that they're gonna have on, on their fisheries based on what we're seeing in regards to our fisheries. So in 2018, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission launched Operation Medusa. And we basically went out with electrofishing gear, which is a, a shocking boat that electrocutes the water, allows us to stun fish and pick them up. We had actual hook and line sampling, rod and reel, as well as limb lines. We also had some opportunities where there were puddles that were very secluded that they were in that we were able just to jump in with a dip net and net them out that way. One way to keep up with the movements of snakeheads is tracking them with radio transmitters, which are implanted in the fish through a surgical procedure. It's a time-consuming process, but the information is invaluable. In order to do a large number of surgeries in one day, it takes a lot of moving parts and a lot of hands to make it work. It probably took around 12 people any time we did a surgery. It takes one person just to dip net fish out of a tank. We put them into an anesthetic, just like you would do for humans. We basically knock them out. They then get moved to a surgical station, which is a concave piece of styrofoam that allows us to basically hold them in an upright position we have to go through and apply a small incision and you have to physically implant the tag into the fish and then you have to suture it back up and that fish was then moved into another tank. Because northern snakeheads are obligate air breathers, if you just threw them back in a tank while they were knocked out, you'd actually kill them. So we actually had to put them in an elevated tank where we could force water across their gills to help remove the anesthesia from their blood and allow them to wake up. After that, they were put onto a fish truck. Then we took them back to the river, took them to the appropriate locations, and then and put them in. 
At that point, we pretty much started tracking as quickly as we can. Each fish is fitted with a transmitter that has a unique signal, which can be tracked in a number of ways. And we can actually go out in the river systems and follow these fish around, figure out their movement patterns and, and, and their distances to, that are traveled. We've also set up receiver boxes that are on the edge of the river. And so what this allows us to do is basically be our ears when we're not there. So if a fish happens to swim past that receiving station, it will denote what day it was, what time it was, and what particular fish did that. And so we actually merge that data with our physical telemetry data, where we drive around in a boat, listen for the fish, we try to get right on top of it, and then we drop a GPS point, and we make some habitat observations. So by combining those two data sets, we have a pretty comprehensive idea of what these fish are wanting to do, directions that they're choosing to travel, and total distances traveled throughout a year period. And we're hoping that we can kind of have a better understanding of, of when we think there's going to be some big movements based on this information. Biologists have noticed one significant difference in the feeding habits of Arkansas snakeheads compared to those in the Potomac. We still have a lot of, of work to do to kind of get the bigger picture, but it looks like out in the Potomac system, they're heavily piscivorous, which means that they eat only fish. Here in Arkansas, they tend to probably be a little more towards the omnivorous, meaning they pretty much are opportunistic feeders. They are eating some fish, but they're also eating a lot of uh, macroinvertebrates or, or bugs. You look at our largemouth bass, very similar. They're also pretty opportunistic feeders. They love to eat crawdads and frogs and minnows. And so there is a very large potential that they could be competing for the same resources. Although there's much more to be learned about snakeheads in Arkansas, the study is giving biologists a better understanding of their population in the natural state. I think one of the biggest things is that we're trying to define what we're calling invasion characteristics. And so it's really important if you're a neighboring state to understand what kind of invasion characteristics a fish has if it's gonna be knocking at your door. So we know that they do seem to move a lot in the summertime upstream and they move downstream in the wintertime, usually associated with big flood pulses. There does appear to be some potential for overlapping diets between northern snakeheads and largemouth bass. And then we are perceiving that they grow pretty quick. We haven't actually had time to go through, cut the otoliths and age them, but they do seem to be growing quickly and are producing eggs at a fairly young rate and a small size. The initial findings hopefully will relieve fears of the so-called fishzilla or frankenfish from taking over the state. Northern snakehead obviously are an invasive species and have caused a lot of problem, but it appears that they may not be quite as damaging as we initially thought, but still illegal. Um, you are not allowed to be in possession of one, either dead or alive. However, we still are asking folks to report them when they catch them. They are an invasive species. Invasive species in general should not be moved around. They shouldn't be imported. A simple fish tank introduction of a male and a female could cause the demise of an entire ecosystem. If they begin to take over, it can cause detrimental effects to fishing, which is actually one of Arkansas's largest resources. Arkansas Wildlife presents the Watch and Win Giveaway. During each episode of Arkansas Wildlife, we'll give away an Arkansas resident hunting and fishing license. At the end of this season, we'll be giving away $500 worth of fishing gear with everything you need for outdoor adventures on Arkansas lakes and streams. It's all provided by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Visit the Arkansas Wildlife webpage at arkansaswildlife.com and click on the Watch and Win icon to enter. This week's winner is Elizabeth Langlois from Pine Bluff. Congratulations and thanks for watching.